Hi. In this video, I'd like to offer a defense of traditional Western philosophy, especially in light of the various challenges and exigencies we're currently facing in the 21st century, and more specifically with regard to the culture of the United States, which is where I live. And as usual, here's a roadmap of the contents of this video. As usual, you can find this same roadmap in the description section of this video, along with links to the timestamps. So anyhow, <laughs> where to begin? Well, I think that one good place to start would be to wonder about what Western philosophy actually is. Basically, what's at the core of the project? Of course, over the last 2,500 years, Western philosophy has taken many different forms and directions, so it can seem like a pretty fruitless task to characterize it in its generality. However, I'd say that at the core of all of Western philosophy's historical meanderings is a project that lies within the words classical Greek etymology, which of course has to do with love of wisdom. But of course, that just defers the question, which then becomes, well, okay, but what is wisdom such that we might find ourselves attracted to it and possibly even in love with it? And at this point, those of you who've been watching my videos for a while can probably anticipate my answer. Basically, wisdom has to do first with our capacity to perceive what life is really asking of us, and then with our ability to respond to it faithfully and harmoniously. In other words, wisdom has to do with our ability to live well, to drink from the wide river of all that life is asking us to experience, and to fill our brief stay in this world with verve, passion, and courage. But the thing that makes wisdom difficult is that it also involves recognizing that our human lot includes many dark and difficult things, not least of which is the vexing riddle of our suffering, our mortality, and the injustices that pervade so much of life. As psychoanalytic thinkers like Carl Jung have discovered, that's very often where wisdom is born, in the well of our shadows and darkness, in the unsettling penumbra of everything we desperately want to repress and deny about ourselves and about life more generally. In other words, wisdom often requires recognizing exactly what we refuse to recognize. Consequently, wisdom requires an extraordinary degree of forthrightness and honesty. But of course, that makes wisdom somewhat paradoxical, because while wisdom requires being honest with ourselves, being honest with ourselves also requires wisdom. And yeah, at first that might seem like a formula for paralysis, but I don't think that it actually is. Like most of the other paradoxical aspects of human existence, it's just life's way of calling us beyond our usual, stolidly linear way of perceiving and understanding things. And here's where I'd say that Western philosophy, especially in the etymological sense of learning to love wisdom, really has something invaluable to offer today's world. Part of that has to do with the ultimate source of a lot of our world's problems. In my view, most of our problems, actually, <laughs> maybe all of them, don't actually have to do with a deficit of intelligence or knowledge as is commonly claimed. For instance, the reason why we so often treat each other callously and cruelly, both in the microcosm of our interpersonal relationships and in the overarching macrocosm of phenomena like genocidal warfare, isn't really because we lack knowledge or cognitive agility. The fact is that the human race already knows plenty, but what we're missing is the ability to live well with what we know. For instance, when you think about it, it takes a fair amount of raw knowledge and intellectual ingenuity to wire an entire planet for instantaneous nuclear obliteration, which we human beings accomplished <laughs> if that's the right word, way back in the mid-20th century. But maybe if we were a little wiser, we might start to find other, less destructive sorts of uses for our time, energy, and talents. I don't know, maybe curing the common cold would be a good start. 
Anyhow, the point I'm trying to make is that at this point in history, our collective human struggle mostly has to do with cultivating our capacity for wisdom and only in a very secondary way with generating ever more knowledge and intelligence. Because without wisdom, it's very easy to find that our vaunted intelligence is mostly serving our relatively petty, relatively superficial impulses and desires, quite irrespective of the consequences to anyone else or even to the planet as a whole, which I'd say is a pretty common phenomenon in today's world. In that regard, I'd say that the paradigm of addiction and not wisdom is presently humanity's primary modus vivendi, and that what life is asking of us these days is to see if we can recognize that unsettling reality and then start to grow beyond it. And in my view, Western philosophy is one of the things that can help with that process, especially by making cultivating wisdom seem attractive and worthwhile to us. That's because, as in the case of romantic love, in order to fall in love with something like wisdom, we first need to be attracted to it, to find ourselves drawn toward its delicious, mysterious dance of possibility, to be seduced by its allure and charms, in a sense, before we can eventually begin to love it, and then eventually learn to live in relation to it. But of course, it's probably not enough just to say that Western philosophy is about falling in love with wisdom. In reality, philosophy is just one possible path. And because life is a wide and varied thing, there are naturally many others. For instance, it's entirely possible to pursue wisdom through aesthetic or creative experience, or perhaps by way of meditation, prayer, or spirituality, or even through experiencing our physicality or sexuality in a particularly profound way. Or, to take a more extreme example from William Blake, if the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. And there's probably some measure of truth in that, especially insofar as wisdom also involves thoroughly understanding what would seem to be its antithesis. But what differentiates Western philosophy from most other possible paths toward wisdom is that it's mostly a cerebral road. That is, most of the time, it's making an appeal to our capacity for thinking and reasoning. Of course, at this point, maybe the question is, well, is a thinking path toward wisdom good for everyone? And I'd say that the fairly obvious answer is, well, not necessarily. Of course, on one hand, I'd say that wisdom springs mostly from a well-integrated way of being, one where our minds, our hearts, and our souls all participate actively in our ongoing experience of life. But on the other hand, the fact is that we human beings are a fairly disparate lot, and so what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else. However, I'd say that for those of us who have some significant predilection for intellectual activity, Western philosophy certainly can be a path toward cultivating a bit more wisdom and perspicacity in this life. But how does philosophy do that? Well, I'd say that a significant part of it has to do with how philosophy helps us pay attention to life's big questions. You know, the kinds of fundamental issues that arise again and again through the slow procession of centuries because, well, <laughs> because those sorts of questions and issues are important to our humanity and not just another fleeting fad. And here's where I'd say that Western philosophy has something to offer us, something related to wisdom, but not necessarily synonymous with it. Basically, philosophy invites us to see things in terms of what's large, in terms of the overall ethical good in life, for instance, or the nature of aesthetic experience, or the limits of our knowledge, or even the nature of reality as such. In turn, seeing things that way, that is, in terms of the big questions and issues, can yield a much deeper and more compelling sense of direction for our energies and a much more amplified sense for the real meaning and substance of our lives, which in turn is probably much more conducive to cultivating actual wisdom. That's because wisdom is not only born in our shadows a lot of the time, as I mentioned earlier, it's also frequently born in the confluence of the large and the small, where the macrocosm meets the microcosm. Which is to say, wisdom is born in our contact with reality. 
But at this particular historical juncture, I'd say that fixating on what's small and inconsequential is relatively easy for most of us. For instance, think about how easy it is to find ourselves thoroughly mesmerized by the ridiculous antics of our world's celebrities and purported superstars, perpetually wallowing in the putrid swamp of their never-ending self-absorption and egoism, constantly taking selfies of their own asses while we gape at them in a slack-jawed rictus of stupefaction. And if that's not enough for you, Consider our collective preoccupation with the politicians and power brokers of the world as they frantically try to one-up each other and elbow each other out of the way so that they can foist their own self-serving ideological agendas on everyone else. <laughs> or hell, just think of the endless everyday grind of trying to claw our way to the next weekend over and over and over again. When you think about it, doesn't about 95% of all that seem... <laughs> well, thoroughly tedious and trivial. And so it seems to me that the trick these days is not to exacerbate that pattern of imbalance, but to attune ourselves, <laughs> at least now and then, to the large, to the universe, to the immensity of time and space that surrounds us, and ultimately to our own participation in the unfolding mystery of life itself. That's the relatively rare commodity, and in my mind, that's also where our world's desperate need meets what philosophy has to offer. And so at this point, I suppose that the obvious question to ask would be, okay, but what keeps things so out of balance? What perpetuates our world's ongoing addiction to triviality at the expense of things like substance and wisdom? Well, it seems to me that a lot of us are caught in a kind of circular trap that goes something like this. It would take wisdom to realize that what our world is missing is wisdom. <laughs> and because of that kind of self-perpetuating circularity, it's very difficult for us to perceive the real sources of the problems that are besetting our world these days. Instead, for the most part, we frantically try to fabricate palliative solutions that almost always fail, mostly because we're not seeing deeply enough and wisely enough into the center of our problems in the first place. In other words, we aren't seeing deeply enough and wisely enough into ourselves. And that, in turn, means that our fundamental difficulties will only continue, despite the wonderful progress we're making in other areas of life, such as that of developing and propagating amazing, life-enhancing technologies. As the old adage goes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And so I suppose that at this point, it's tempting to wonder about what might possibly reverse that trend. What might provide us with a sufficiently powerful moment of discontinuity and disorientation within the predictable regularity of the world as we know it? Personally, I don't think that the answer is going to issue from government, which would probably be the first place to look. The reason is that it's not really in power's interest for us to become genuinely wise or too philosophical, especially since all of that would probably make us far less predictable and far more able to perceive how we're being perpetually hobbled and enslaved, and far less susceptible to crude manipulation than we'd otherwise be. That's because power's primary interest is always to preserve and amplify itself. And the best way of doing that is to keep everything as unchanging and predictable as possible. So personally, I wouldn't be too quick to expect any real improvement in our relation to life to come from government or politics for that matter. At this point, it's probably tempting to look to education, where I work, to help foster wisdom in our world. But here too, there are significant difficulties, the first of which has to do with the fact that the institution of education always reflects our cultural values and priorities, and also its problems and pathologies. So basically, when education starts to invite people to question the status quo too deeply, well, to put it in rather crude, mercantile terms, it won't be long before it loses its funding. And the fact is that the language of wisdom usually sounds like incomprehensible gibberish to our cultural sensibilities. Hell, at least in the United States where I live. 
And so it doesn't figure very prominently, if at all, in the various metrics we use to define, evaluate, and ultimately fund education. Of course, beyond drawing us toward wisdom, studying philosophy also fosters our ability to think critically, which actually does fall, at least nominally, within education's current purview. Basically, critical thinking has to do with our ability to evaluate ideas with regard to their principal strengths and weaknesses. But all things considered, I'd say that even that is only a very secondary or even tertiary goal for education, especially in comparison to the task of producing competent workers with practical job skills for the marketplace. And what all of that eventually generates is a populace that, yeah, may have some job skills, but very little understanding of life and very little idea about where the human race is heading or why it's desirable for us all to be going there in the first place. And so, in a way, it's entirely natural that we would end up doing things like wiring our planet for instantaneous nuclear obliteration. It's because, in the absence of any palpable, deeply meaningful sense of engagement with life, we always tend to fix our attention on the next available carrot, the next shiny bauble, all the while longing for the next ultimately unsatisfying distraction, with precious little regard for the big picture. You know, where the overall journey of life is taking us. And sure, I suspect that at some deep level, a lot of us can sense that. I bet that most of us realize, however vaguely, that there's something not quite right with the world, that there's some pretty deep gaps and fault lines running underneath the surface of the whole vision of life we're being sold. But probably most of us feel helpless against the utter immensity of all of that, like we're caught in an irresistible and inexorable tide that's pulling us ever farther out to sea, ever farther into a terrifying, trackless expanse of open ocean. And there's not much it seems like we can do about it. So. If it's really true that we can't rely too much on government or even on the institution of education to guide us in any consistent or reliable way toward the kind of wisdom that philosophy offers us, then what can we possibly do? Well, I think that there actually is a lot for us to do, but I hate to tell you that it's not going to be easy. And we're first going to have to give up the debilitating, addictive habit of trying to fob off our problems onto someone else, onto government or education, for instance, or any other social institution for that matter. The unpleasant truth is that at some point, we're going to have to start to solve our own problems, mostly by learning to take personal responsibility for the quality of our lives and for the quality of the world we're building through them. In other words, contrary to popular opinion, it's pretty much an exercise in futility, false hope, and wasted effort to try to force any social institution to do the heavy lifting for us. Mostly because those institutions are themselves wedded to the very kinds of malaise we're hoping they'll cure. So I'd say that if we really want to better the world, the most important task in this life is to become wise ourselves, to become philosophical in our own souls if we're so inclined, or perhaps to find wisdom along some other road if that's our predilection. But that sort of thing can definitely be a bit tricky, especially in the Western world, mostly because in the Western world, a lot of us think that the only way things change is when we force them to change. But the fact is that the muses of our greater wisdom don't usually respond well to volitional commands and projects. Instead, cultivating wisdom is mostly about allowing. Allowing ourselves to become permeable and receptive to its subtle signs and intimations. Allowing it to move through us like our breath, which in turn means letting go of a lot of what we desperately cling to in this life. Having to be right, for instance, or thinking we're in control and knowing what we're doing, which in the end only keeps us perpetually enslaved to our own egoistic attachments and desires. But the muses of our greater wisdom are always infinitely more vast than that. In essence, if we hope to become wise, 
we're going to have to step beyond the whole paradigm of relating to life mostly through willful, programmatic agendas, and instead learn the subtle art of allowing. But in any case, from what I can see, the only way our world really changes is when we ourselves change. The rest is just a never-ending theater of excuses, evasions, and deceptions, both at the personal level as well as at the level of our collective enterprise. Let me just say it bluntly. No so-called leader is ever going to make our lives better or make the world better either, mainly because, well, because that's our job, not someone else's. And while that may seem like an unpleasant, somewhat dismal prospect, at the same time, it's also the locus of our deep empowerment. Our way out of serving as mere pawns in someone else's ideological chess game. It's a way of becoming vital, indispensable agents in our world's ongoing struggle to give birth to something beyond itself. Something far bolder and far more brilliant than anything we can imagine. And it seems to me that at this point in history, the stakes couldn't be much higher. In my view, we're living at the crossroads of history, where all of our choices and all of our faltering attempts to find wisdom really do matter. And if you don't believe that, again consider the fact that we're all living in an epoch when eschatology, that is, how we think about the end of the world, is no longer just a matter of capricious literary fantasy, but a living technological reality that surrounds us every minute of the day. And as a consequence, it seems to me that the only question that really matters is, when are we going to find enough courage within ourselves to live toward the real depth of life and let go of the kinds of debilitating addictive habits that only make the human race way smaller and way more petty than it really needs to be? Basically, when are we going to find enough courage to lay claim to the kind of wisdom that's part and parcel of our deep human birthright? And I'd say that all things considered, the best answer to that question is right now, in this exact moment. Well, why not? Anyhow, <laughs> Okay, well, thanks as always for watching, and as always, see if you can be wise enough to take care of your soul.